Are you struggling with how to get that success and manifest the life that you want? By the end of this interview with author Richard Koch, you're going to know exactly how to do just that. <laughs> I've been recognized as one of the top attorneys in the country. I've also written a couple of best-selling books, Negotiate Like You Matter and Breaking Free, a Step-by-Step -Step Divorce Guide. And I've helped millions of people by bringing you content just like this. So if that sounds really great to you and you want to achieve success in your life, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And that way we can stay in connection with each other and you can get some amazing tips. So without further ado, let's dive into my conversation with best-selling author, Richard Koch. Welcome to another episode of Negotiate Your Best Life. I'm Rebecca Zung, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure today to welcome Richard Koch. He is a graduate of Oxford University. He got his MBA from Wharton. Um, at Penn. He has worked with some of the greatest organizations in the world, including Bain Capital and Boston Consulting Group. And he's authored or co-authored more than 25 books in business and personal success. His book, The 80-20 Principle, has become a classic, having been named by GQ as one of the top 25 business books of all time, and it has sold more than a million copies and has been translated into more than 40 languages. So his most recent book is Unreasonable Success and How to Achieve It, and we are going to talk about that today, and he's holding it up for those of you who are not uh, watching, but just listening. Um, and I've had the pleasure of being able to read it. Uh, and uh, it's so fascinating, so fascinating. We're going to talk about it in terms of how to deal with n narcissists and negotiation and, and get that unreasonable success. So welcome, Richard. Rebecca, it's a great privilege and pleasure and thank you for um, saying all those very very kind things about me not many people have such a good introduction or at least such a complimentary introduction even if it's not quite uh, always 100 percent accurate but it, it was accurate thank you oh well it's my pleasure my pleasure and i i want to know a little bit more about your background and how you came to be who you are today and and writing all these incredible books. So where did you start? I think the best place to start is really the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which is a, one of the copyright libraries of the world. And so therefore it has all of the books which are published. And one day when I was uh, an undergraduate, a history undergraduate at Oxford, I happened to be in the Bodleian Library and I thought, wouldn't it be fun to order up a book that I would never normally read? And I'd heard about this guy, the economist, uh, Alfredo, Vilfredo Pareto. And um, he was a professor at Lausanne University in the 1890s. And he wrote what was reckoned to be a very seminal book on economics. It, it was in French. And my French was just about up to being able to understand it. Uh, and it was called The Course of uh, Economic Theory. So that sounds very dull, doesn't it? But actually, I got this book and I just couldn't believe how interesting it was because he had discovered that if he looked at the wealth of people in England, which was where he started, that in the 19th century, a very, very small proportion of people had either the most income or the most assets net worth. Um, and But the thing that really excited him was that it was almost a linear log-log relationship. In other words, every time the, uh, the uh, income or wealth doubled, the proportion of people who had it went down by a factor of, well, it was a constant factor, it, but it was a very considerable factor. So in other words, the, the wealthier people became, or the wealthier people were, the much smaller proportion of the population they uh, covered. And then he looked at the same thing in earlier centuries, in England in the 18th century, 17th century, 16th century, and so on and so forth. And then he looked at uh, different countries, at Italy and France and Switzerland itself, where he was working. 
and he discovered that the relationship was almost a perfect fit. Uh, he used an algebra algebraic equation rather than anything visual, but nevertheless, he was really, really excited about this. And he took that and, and said, look, this is a law of nature. This is something which seems to be, regardless of the political setup in a particular country, regardless of the history of the country, it just seems to be something that always works. Now, that excited him. But what excited me was that I started thinking about how you could use this. And since I was studying history, um, all of the degree at Oxford in history was on the final examination. So there's no continuous assessment, no examinations in the first year, second year, and so on. It all happened at the end of the third year. And they gave you a series of 11 papers, which you had to write uh, three hour examinations and you could answer three or four questions. But the thing was that there were about 50 or 60 or 70 questions that you could choose from. It almost took you five minutes to actually read the thing to start with. Um, and so it suddenly occurred to me that maybe I could use this theory, which has later been described as the 80-20 rule, or in, in my terms, the 80-20 principle, because it isn't a rule, it's just something, that ten, a general tendency. And, and it could be used because if I could discover the 20% of questions that cropped up 80% of the time, or 90% of the time, I could limit the amount of stuff that I had to study and, and to go into tremendous depth on that. And, and actually, I stood a good chance of getting a very, very good degree without working very hard. So that was the theory, and it worked. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Every, every single paper, I could answer three or four questions. I wouldn't have been able to answer five or six or seven, but I only had to answer three. So, so that, to me, has been a constant theme in my life. I'm, I'm sort of, in a way, I'm cheating, you know, I'm, I'm gaming the system, but I'm actually using it, you know, to, to do things which discover things in depth and things that are important rather than to try and cover the waterfront. And I've made a whole philosophy out of this. This was what the 80-20 principle was all about, because a lot of people had discovered previously that in business, 80% of profits are made by 20% of people or 20% of the products or 20% of the customers or whatever. And they use, you can use that to actually concentrate on the very important customers, not, not necessarily the wealthiest, not necessarily uh, the people who use the products the most, but the people who are most profitable because if they have a low cost to serve, they will take a standard product or whatever. So, you know, firms can use this. Well, that was fine because everyone had sort of pretty much understood that. But what I did was to reinterpret it and, and apply it to people's personal lives. And this connects a little bit, I think, with, with where you're going because, because I discovered that there were certain things that you could do which were more likely to make you happy, for example. Uh, and, and that involved, for example, concentrating your time, your spare time, or possibly your whole time on people that you really enjoyed interacting with. That is so simple, but actually so powerful. And that the counterintuitive thing is that we don't tend to do that. You know, a lot of time people spend time with uh, other people because they're work colleagues or because they are uh, friends of their spouse or because they are um, uh, neighbors or something like that. And they don't actually spend time with the people with whom time is an absolute pleasure to be spent. And I just said, if you just rearrange that a little bit and spend less time with the people that you don't particularly like, or in many cases that you actually don't <laughs> like at all, uh, and concentrate on the people that you do like, and so on and so forth. And I wrote about money. I know that you, you've written about money as well. You know, it, it's all exactly the same thing. And it boils down to this, that very few things matter, but they matter enormously. So the thing to do is to concentrate on the things that are most important. And I think if you think about, I mean, I haven't really written about relationships, but it does seem to me that in relationships, it may be true as well. Do you think that there are very few things that determine whether a relationship is going to be successful or unsuccessful? Well, I think so. I mean, I, I obviously, I think that it, it really, it depends on the people and what's most important to them. And if you look at you know, like the five love languages and things like that. I mean, you know, um, that author has boiled it down to, you know, if you speak the person's love language, then you're probably more likely to 
succeed in the relationship, right? So I think it, it is very similar. I think all of it can be boiled down to the same thing. And, you know, I know uh, our mutual friend, Mike Zeller, even talks about the 20% of the 20%, you know, the 4%, uh, and really just focusing on that. But I want to talk about your new book, Unreasonable Success, because I found it very, very fascinating. What you've done is actually um, boil down success into nine landmarks that you don't necessarily have to hit every single one. But what you've said is most people who've re achieved, you know, what we consider to be unreasonable success or the outliers that you, you reference Malcolm Gladwell's uh, book outliers in the beginning of your book uh, is, you know, what is that? And, and I, I love it because it can really be applied to how to negotiate with difficult people or, you know, some people refer to as narcissistic people. And, um, and, and what I also found fascinating about the book, for any of you out there who wants to go ahead and grab it, which I recommend that you do, is that you use fascinating characters, people that we are all familiar with, to highlight and give examples of where they achieved those landmarks. And so you actually refer to all different types of people. I mean, there's uh, Albert Einstein and Madonna. And, you, you know, you go from- They don't usually go together, do they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and, and the, it, yeah. you know, Bob Dylan to Da Vinci or Viktor Frankl. I mean, there's all different types of people. Yeah. So it's not just, this is the person. And also Steve Jobs, who I have always found to be a very fascinating guy. So it, it's, it, it's really interesting how you take these landmarks and then actually go through examples using these people in um, either history or even current. So what I wanna do is actually go through um, each one of the people on the map uh, and go through the map a little bit with, um, with you and, and starting with mindset and self-belief. So I always say that 80% of a negotiation is won before you even walk into a room. I recently interviewed Bob Proctor and he corrected me and said it was 95%. Uh, so I'm not gonna say that Bob Proctor was wrong. It might be 95%, but so much of it has to do with your mindset and your first landmark of success, which you call unreasonable success is self-belief. I wanna talk about that. I also, I guess I should ask you to define what you define as unreasonable success, and then we'll go into self-belief. Okay, Un unreasonable success in a way is success that you don't deserve. <laughs> and in a way, none of us really deserve. I mean, unreasonable success is sort of fantastic success. You know, someone has actually changed the world in some way. But if you actually look at the people who've been successful, 20 people in, in my book, the thing about them is that they tended to be oddballs in many ways. They weren't conventional. They were not a safe pair of hands. You know, they weren't necessarily terribly competent. But one of the things which they had was self-belief. And we'll, there are some other things that they had as well. The key to doing anything is really to have great confidence in yourself, but not necessarily in yourself because you're a wonderful human being, but yourself because you're actually doing something that aligns very strongly with your, your values and aligns very strongly with your skills and is important and useful. So belief in what you do can become belief in, in who you are, which I think is very important. But self-belief is the most important foundation of unreasonable success. You say for negotiation, I think it's for tr true for, for everything, that there are very few people in the world who truly, truly do have self and that means that if you're one of those relatively few people, you've got a huge head start. And if you don't have it, your life is probably going to be missing in several important ingredients and not as useful to other people and to yourself as it could be otherwise. So one of the things when I'm talking to people and I'm, I'm trying to make more 
unreasonably successful people, as it were, by giving a little bit of advice here and there to people that I come across. You know, the first thing I start with is self-belief and ask people, you know, where would you give yourself a one out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 in terms of self-belief? And it's, it's remarkable that very, very few people give themselves a nine or a 10 to start with. And then I can, I can start to, to talk to them. There are lots of things that you can do to develop self-belief. I don't, I don't think it's true that you necessarily have to have a Napoleon complex. You know, you always believed in your star and, and, and all the rest of it. I think a lot of that is, is, is rewriting history when very, very successful people uh, pretend that they've always had this belief in themselves. It's something that can grow over time and needs to develop uh, and, and be nurtured. But it is something which is possible. And one of the things that I discuss in the book are ways to do it. For example, one of the other landmarks is having a transforming experience. And I define a transforming experience as meaning that you go into a, a company or an organization or a social movement or a place, a time in your life, whatever it is, and you go in as one person, Rebecca, and you come out of that as a different person a person who is 10 times or infinitely more powerful and effective and self-confident. And therefore, the people in the book were very lucky in a way because none of them organized their um, transforming experience. And some of those transforming experiences were very um, unfortunate. You mentioned Viktor Frankl, who was one of the great psychotherapists of the, of the 20th century. His transforming experience was being sent to Auschwitz by Adolf Hitler. So, you know, it's not necessarily something which is, which is great, but you do need a transforming experience, or probably need a transforming experience, if you're going to develop self-belief to the absolute maximum, and if you're going to be very, very, very unreasonably successful. So that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things I always say to people, have you had a transforming experience? Rebecca, did you have a transforming experience? You must have done to do what you what you're doing, I reckon. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the transforming experience was probably uh, founding my own law firm and 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 being able to see that, look, I can actually do this. I can grow a multi-million dollar firm. I mean, I remember when I started my firm, I actually signed a lease and I hired a paralegal. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I really hope I'm not putting my family in financial peril by doing this. You know, I hope I don't just, I had taken over a friend's small practice. And I remember thinking, I hope I don't just finish these clients and then never get another one of my own. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, I think that that was a transforming experience. I also think it was a breakthrough achievement though, for me. I mean, as I was going through, I think, you know, by stepping up and facing your fears and going forward and then seeing, hey, I did it. Look at me. I was actually able to do that. That gives you a lot more confidence, too, to keep going on your map of success and keep go moving to the next place on the landmark. Um, so talk about breakthrough achievements a little bit. Yes, a breakthrough achievement is something which changes the world, changes your world, that changes the world of people around you. And in some large or small way, actually makes uh, what you, your, your, uh, uh, the guy you mentioned before, Steve Jobs, uh, as a dent in the universe. <laughs> well, uh, it sounds a bit like a car crash, but, but it's a dent in the universe, exactly what we want to, to achieve. One of the things about a breakthrough experience is that you only need one of them at least initially, you only need one of them to make a huge difference. And we always think that we're very short of time, which is another of the themes that emerges from the 80-20 principle, because I, I don't think we're short of time because we make such bad use of most of it. And because most of our achievements are concentrated in a relatively small proportion of either our time on a weekly basis or our years that we have. So you can, you can actually uh, basically uh, drift for years and years and years and then suddenly circumstances come together you know if you believe in the power of the universe you might say the universe in sort, sort of things is, is arranging things so that you can actually have an extraordinary impact but one of the things is is to actually define <laughs> what is going to be or what has been your breakthrough achievement and it's very powerful because 
you know, we all think of doing things, you know, each year you might make New Year resolutions. You might say, this year I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. But actually, that's not very helpful. What is helpful is to say, what would really change the world? You know, what can I do? It might take 10 years. It might be something you could do relatively quickly. But, you know, once you've done it, you actually got a solid achievement, which has really made a difference to people's lives. And what is that? Well, you know, it could be that you actually develop an idea which is uh, propagated and which uh, helps and influences a lot of people. It could be that you start a company which has like jobs, you know, Apple has fantastic products and so on and so forth, which have definitely changed people's lives. Not necessarily always for the better, but nevertheless, uh, largely. Uh, or it could be something like uh, Viktor Frankl or like uh, Paul of Tarsus, another guy in the book, known as St. Paul, or I hate calling him St. Paul because it makes him sound like an old fuddy-duddy you know, establishment figure, which was the very opposite of what he was. He was a complete revolutionary. Yeah. But, you know, it could be, you know, getting Christianity uh, to take over the Roman Empire, <laughs> which was quite an achievement. It didn't happen even in his lifetime, but he started the process whereby that, that, that happened. So what is, what is going to be your, uh, anyone listening to this, what is going to be your breakthrough achievement? Because I tell you absolutely that if you don't have a breakthrough achievement in mind, it's very unlikely that you'll actually achieve one. And I use as an example, uh, Winston Churchill, who everyone thinks, you know, Winston Churchill was bound to be successful. But for most of his career, Winston Churchill was a total and utter failure. And he had a lot of advantages. His father was um, the Chancellor of Exchequer, the, the uh, finance minister, effectively, of late 19th century Britain. Uh, he met prime ministers at his father's home who treated him as an adult when they had lunch or dinner. Uh, and so on. So he, he, at a very early age, he became a soldier and had a distinguished career in the in the Boer War, fighting the the Afrikaans people in South Africa. Uh, he uh, escaped from captivity, was captured, and he made a big fortune out of going and telling the story in lectures in America and, and Britain and so on. Um, he was Home Secretary very early on, and so on and so forth. But everything that he touched ended in disaster. There was something called the Gallipoli campaign, which was a harebrained idea that rather than chewing uh, barbed wire on the Western Front in Europe, what they could do was go around to the, the sort of you know, Southern Europe and go through Turkey and, and somehow win that way. There, there were a huge number of casualties from that. He was partly responsible for the general strike of 1926 in Britain. Um, he was uh, lost nearly all his money in the Wall Street crash in 1929. <laughs> uh, he opposed uh, a very mild measure of self-government for India, and he thought Mahatma Gandhi was the Antichrist, you know, and his judgment was terrible. He made great speeches, but judgment was terrible. But in the late, mid to late 1930s, Hitler, uh, sorry, Churchill was the first person to realize that Hitler was a threat to the world, you know, serious threat. And for seven or eight years, he, he actually developed this theme that Hitler absolutely had to be defeated. And that was his breakthrough achievement. And, you know, he was propelled to become prime minister when everything he forecast about Hitler's ambitions proved to be correct, that Hitler would not stop just having taken over Austria. He would also want Czechoslovakia and he'd want Poland and so on and so forth, you know. And, and, and um, Churchill had been proved right. He was made prime minister. And then for the next five years, he devoted his life just to that one thing. He said, you know, my life is very simple because every day I get up, I think how can we defeat Adolf Hitler? And that was, what, that was all that he did. Yeah. Uh, but unless he'd actually defined the breakthrough achievement correctly, which during most of his life he didn't do, he, he thought that he would you know, make these little achievements or maybe he thought they were big achievements, they were the wrong thing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely critical that people think, what is going to be my breakthrough achievement? And it's... Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really fascinating. And I want to skip ahead so that we hit a couple of points that I think are really important here. And, and it actually, it's a good segue talking about how Churchill, even though 
he's only one of, I think, three of the people that you highlight that had some sort of, um, you know, what people would maybe characterize an, as an advantage in yes. life going forward. But um, so one of the things, number seven on your landmark map is thriving on setbacks, which I think is actually one of the hardest things to do. I mean, you know, you've, you've heard these expressions fall down seven times, get up eight and all of that, but it's really, really hard. Sometimes when people have a lot of setbacks, they just give up. And, you know, you know that the, those old stories about how the goalpost was only three feet away or whatever, and that's when people quit. It. Um, so talk about that and how important that is and how to do that. Uh, it's something that, that I, I discovered in my life, actually, was that, that in my late 20s, I was complete failure in my first really serious job, which was at the Boston Consulting Group. And it was, to me, it was, uh, it was a transforming experience because it, it taught me the whole basis of my um, theories about how to make money, which is the star principle, which is that you, you actually want to have a company which is the leader in a fast growth market or a fast growth segment. It might start off really, really small. The segment might not even exist to start with before the firm invents it. But, you know, that is the way to make money. And I know that, I, you know, without being immodest, I've grow my assets at 22% a year after tax for 37 years. And it's not because I'm clever, it's because I'm using this very, very simple principle and I stick to, to this principle. However, despite learning all that, I wasn't very good at what BCG, Boston Consulting Group actually valued, which was high duty, sorry, heavy uh, quantitative analysis. I was pretty useless at that. <laughs> and, and therefore they sort of asked me to leave. And for someone who'd always derived a sense of, of my worth from my achievements and success academically and so on and so forth, it was absolutely devastating blow. Uh, they were quite nice about it, but, but nevertheless, I, I could not cope with the idea of being a failure. But in a way, it was a defining moment for me because I said to myself, well, maybe I should go and do something else. You know, maybe I should become a headhunter. And I interviewed with Egon Zender and other, you know, people who do executive search at a very high level. Um, and and in the end, I said, no, actually, though Egon Zender offered me a job, um, I said, no, I actually want to stick to the, the industry, which I knew, which was this analysis of competition and sort of microeconomic analysis, essentially. And even though I might not be very good as an analyst, I thought I was quite good at working out what the principles were there and talking to clients about it and applying it to their business. So I then decided to interview with Bain and Company and I had the good fortune to meet Bill Bain, who was also a historian <laughs> when he was an undergraduate. So that was very helpful. In fact, he'd been a postgraduate as, as well. Uh, and, and we got on very well. And he understood the economics of his business better than any uh, management consultant in the world ever has before or after, because he, his view was very simple. You need a few clients which fit in with the 80-20 principle. You want to have a very high budget with those clients. You want to make a huge difference to the value of their company. And then you can grow within the client without having to have new clients. Of course, you'd have a few new clients as well, but those new clients would be recommended by the very happy chief executives in the existing clients. So it was a system that required no website, it required no brochures, it required no sales, no marketing. Uh, it was just a fantastic formula, which he devised and then whatever. Anyway, I, I really liked that. And they made me a partner after a very short period of time, but i had never been even an, the next level down, the manager in, within Boston Consulting Group. But anyway, they made me a manager very quickly, then they made me a partner. And then I left <laughs> to go with two other guys. And we, it, what you did, we started a firm based around what we already knew how to do. And then we discovered that we had to do something slightly different in order to be successful. But, you know, that to me all came from failing. You know, it all came from one failure. Now, you know, it might be that you have repeated failures and so on and so forth. But, you know, uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb's written what I think is his finest book called Anti-Fragile, which is his way of describing 
something that likes being broken. So he talks about going into the post office, uh, mailing your, uh, you know, normally you'd go in with, you know, some uh, China uh, vases or some uh, very um, delicate um, uh, wine glasses uh, that you want to send to someone and you mark it fragile. Okay, but he says, no, actually, the, what you want to do is go in with something which is anti-fragile and say, please break it, <laughs> please send it. Please, please get the, um, Please get the guys who do the um, uh, the bags, bag hand, baggage handlers to to, to smash it, or whatever. And so, in a way, it's it's making a virtue out of something that is, you know, very unpleasant. And you know, Viktor Frankl was anti-fragile. Even even the concentration camps couldn't break him, and it was anti-fragile for him because he had written a book which was taken away. All his possessions were taken away when he arrived at the concentration camp, and uh, what he did was to write down on tiny little slips of paper what he what he'd written about, and by the time he left there, he got you know on cigarette packets and stuff like that. He he recreated his book, and his his breakthrough achievement initially was just to survive with the the basis of his book and to outlive Adolf Hitler. I think that's a sort of you know common theme for two of these people, and so you know the setbacks can be enormously valuable because they can define exactly what you want to do. And they can tell you how to use um, the very few opportunities you get, you know, metaphorically, if you like, the tiny scraps of paper that come in, in a concentration camp to actually do something fantastic, which is to recreate a whole, a whole book. And he imagined, Victor Frankl imagined himself lecturing into huge auditoria after uh, the war after Adolf Hitler had been defeated and of course if he hadn't done that he wouldn't have survived you need to have no purpose to survive and that fitted in very much with his personal philosophy which says we're not really motivated by pleasure or pain or money or whatever we're motivated by meaning and if, uh, if there's not meaning in your life it's only half of a, of a life so the thing about setbacks also is that if you go far down it does open up the possibility, at least if you believe in opposites, of going far up. In other words, you can, you know, the further down you go, in a way, it says that you're in a different league from ordinary people. You're not actually uh, at the same level of, you know, very minor success. If you have very major failure, perhaps a major success is going to come afterwards. It's a, it's a mindset. It's just a way of thinking about things. Um, it's also because... You know, Rebecca, I believe life is a game in many ways. I think, it, I think you have to do the delicate thing of thinking seriously about your success, but at the same time, not taking it too seriously. Because the things that you succeed in doing and the things that I noticed with these very successful people, they very often came along by accident. They were opportunities which, which cropped up, which were sort of very muffled opportunities in many cases, but they actually then seized them as the... Uh, Bismarck, the greatest uh, European statesman of the 19th century, is in the book. And that's exactly what he did. You know, his greatest success came in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, when he thought that, uh, that uh, Prussia, his country, was going to be defeated by Napoleon III, the French emperor. And so, you know, by seizing what looks like, you know, almost the end, you know, by seizing an opportunity, by rewriting a uh, telegram, the Ems telegram, I won't go into the details, you know, he was able to turn what was almost certain humiliation for Prussia into a huge success because he got the sympathy of the other uh, smaller German states who got very annoyed by France and said, well, you know, if the emperor's going to do that, then we'll line up with Bismarck and we'll go and march on Paris, and which is exactly what they did, and th threw Napoleon out, and then they founded the German Empire for, for good and for evil. But, but, you know, it's very often the leading to success, something that is, is very terrible. And it's quite consoling, isn't it, that however bad things get, you know, I hope that none of us are ever going to be in a concentration camp, but however bad things get, they can actually get a big be bit better. And that may be the same in Perhaps that's the same in relationships and perhaps in some marriages that have gone wrong, 
but actually when they hit bottom in a way that do you think that can sometimes be liberating because it says look we can't go on like this we need to recreate our own independent existence well i think a lot of times the worst thing that happens to you ends up being the best thing that happens to you i mean you know whether it's a, a divorce or a situation with a narcissistic business partner, which a lot of people in my audience have those, um, you know, it really, it, it just doesn't, you know, I've had to deal with a couple of narcissists or difficult personalities in my own life. I think, you know, if you live on this planet, we all have. And uh, so I think that, you know, many times it does seem like the worst things that are happening at the time, you, you know, it, it's hard to find meaning in that sometimes. But, um, you know, Viktor Frankl is a beautiful example of somebody who was able to find meaning in one of the worst possible situations. I mean, if he can find meaning in being in a concentration camp, I mean, any of us can find meaning in anything, right? So it's very inspirational. Yeah. I want to just jump ahead because we're, we're just about out of time. And I love yeah. the distort reality piece. Uh, you know, I was fascinated by Steve Jobs and his biography and how he was able to do that. And, you know, when I was talking to somebody recently and they were talking about the word reasonable and the word reasonable in and of itself is really a measurement that is completely subjective, right? I mean, yep. you know, we say unreasonable, but maybe that's reasonable to somebody else. And so I love the idea of distorting what we think is reality or what other people think is reality, because reality is really in the same realm as reasonable as far as uh, very subjective in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Rebecca, reasonable really means um, what current reality is. And unreasonable, in a way, just means innovation. It means doing something that hasn't been done. Whether or not people say it's impossible, they might not even know that uh, it's mooted, you know. But, but what the, you know, reality is, you know, everything going in order, you know. But the world isn't like that. There's chaos in the world. There's disorder. There's change. There are disruptions. There are discontinuities. And so therefore, it, once you, once you realize that there is nothing inevitable about what is, then you can create what isn't. And that is what I call distorting reality. And, and Jobs was wonderful at that. Uh, but distorting reality has got sort of, you know, two, two elements to it. One, one, I know we're very short of time, but one element is actually uh, persuading yourself that you can do something that's never been done before. The other one, which is a higher form of art, which Jobs was absolutely the past master at, was persuading other people that they could do things that they never thought that they could do. Well, him, he, he completely changed the world. I mean, he, yeah. can, he totally changed the world. I mean, I remember when I read his biography where he was talking, somebody was saying to him, well, you need to get a focus group to find out what people want. And I remember him saying, I don't need a focus group because they don't even know what they want. I'm going to tell them what they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, who knew that we needed an iPhone that had apps and all this other stuff? I mean, you know, he told us what we wanted, right? Yeah. I mean, he's totally changed the world in, in that because of his quote unquote distorted reality, which was in his in his mind what reality was going to be. He was defining it. And that was a man who had huge setbacks. I mean, imagine starting what you thought was a marvelous company, Apple Computer, as it was then, and then getting thrown out of the company. Of your own company. Of your <laughs> own company, of which you own, of which you own 10%. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, just, it's just crazy. Because it's soft, a soft drink sales, <laughs> actually was the chief executive and persuaded the board to get rid of you. And, and then, but of course, meanwhile, he goes over and, and while he's, you know, being outcast from his own company, he goes and starts, oh, Pixar, by the way. I yeah. mean, it's just crazy. I mean, yeah, and Pixar loses a huge amount of money until they, they do this uh, little thing called Toy Story or Tin Toy, which is the yeah, original. Toy Story. Yeah. Yeah. And somehow, you know, this company, which is hugely unsuccessful, then became very successful, but they, it, but it was on a knife edge, you know, basically, they were just about to go bust when they uh, persuaded Disney to to do a collaboration with them uh, and then the collaboration nearly fell apart because they had different ideas about what what this little movie should be 
Uh, and then, of course, you know, he had another company which which was a total failure and arrested. And then he gets called in because. Apple was about to go bankrupt in 1996 and 1997. Otherwise, you know, that looks like a bit, bit, bit of a setback for everyone, doesn't it? And then he goes in with five, five weeks cash flow. And basically- but he doesn't just like, you know, go, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Oh, well, yeah. you know, I mean, so I, I just wanna ask one question before we wrap up here for you. What's, what's your why? What motivates you? I think it's concepts, actually, and making money, actually. I mean, I find making money one of the easiest things in the world. That sounds really arrogant and stupid, doesn't it? But it's true. And that's the game as well. You know, well, that, because that really... it's your self-belief, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think I know the formula for doing it, but each particular has, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of a deal at the moment, and one day it's going fantastically, and another day it's going very badly. Today wasn't a great day from that point of view. But, so, but so you know, wouldn't you say that of all your nine landmarks, isn't self-belief probably the most important one? I mean, if you don't have that, you can't do it's, It is a sine qua non, yeah. Without that, nothing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think so. So, let's, I think so, too. so, so you know, let's make ourselves all believe in ourselves because that that's not just to, to be big headed or whatever. It's to, to begin to stand a chance to change the world and to, to improve the world for yourself and for other people. So if you don't believe in yourself in a way, that's a bit selfish because you're depriving the world of what could be. And uh. that's not I so, love that. What a beautiful way to end. So where can people find out more about you and your books? And I'm going to put links to both the 80-20 principle and unreasonable success in the show yeah, notes. I've got, I've, got a hand, I've got to hold it up again. Unreasonable success and how to achieve it. Uh, they can go to my uh, website, which is www.richardkosh, or one word, .net. I couldn't afford .com. Uh, .net. <laughs> So, uh, and um, they can find me on Twitter at Richard Kosh 8020, uh, at Richard Kosh 8020. Okay. But anyway, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, Rebecca, and I very much admire what you do in helping people liberate themselves from, uh, from failure uh, and uh, start again. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining me on this interview with Richard Koch. Such incredible tips. I mean, really an amazing guy and so inspirational. So if you like this interview, make sure you like it. Drop me a comment. Let me know what you loved about it or what you're going to do to change your life today that he gave uh, whatever tips you like the best. And make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell. And if you want to get something free from me, you can get grab my free Crush My Negotiation prep worksheet. It's 15 pages. It's basically an ebook and it's free, all yours. Just grab it at winmynegotiation.com. And also feel free to please join my free private Facebook group, which is Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung and um, get the support that you need in there. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of Negotiate Your Best Life. And I will see you in the next video.